Good morning. How are you? Good morning, sir. Good to see you. How are you guys? Uh, pretty well, thank you. Even with the players hopping and skipping and conditioning and everything that, that's <laughs> going on with the 8 in the morning and stuff like that, like, do you go in there for that, like, to watch the whole thing? And, not allowed to. Oh, you're not? Not allowed to. Yeah, they strictly... I'm glad you said that because yeah, I was in too. there I'm five minutes asked, and I was wondering, wondering where you were. <laughs> yeah, no, we're uh, coaches are not allowed on oh. the field uh, for the first two weeks. Not even on the field, not, not even talking. On the field. Well, that's yeah. dumb. Now, you know, there, there, there are windows in this building. So if it wasn't, yeah. uh, you know, pouring <laughs> rain right now, maybe there'd be some windows. But, uh, okay. but no, we are not allowed in there. That's why, you know, I, I know hmm. yesterday talking about Josh Hinkst and, and Tyler Williams, they basically control uh, the first couple weeks here as we prepare these guys yeah. for the next phase, which then we can get on the field in phase two. Um, we kind of split the team up, offense, defense. We're on the field at different times of the day. That way, you know, I can be, you know, having a little bit more of a role with the defense as they kind of build the techniques, fundamentals, start building the defense, and we do the same thing offensively. A little bit more of a passing kind of camp feel to it at that point, but we do uh, start putting in our offense from a standpoint of the run game and, and, and how we marry it all up and, and try to build the system. Uh, the the uh, rumor has it, or or did you go to the Masters this weekend? I did. did. What was that like? It was my second time. I was actually uh, there in 2019. Um, Tiger had just bogeyed uh, hole five, and we were uh, you know near the tee box on hole six. Went on to birdie hole six and win the tournament, so I thought I would have that <laughs> impact on him again. Unfortunately, uh, Scotty Scheffler had another thing going, but it was phenomenal. It's yeah. such an unbelievable place and uh, wow. got a chance to, you know, meet a lot of great people, spend some time with Jim Nance and mm. Scott Van Pelt and, and just kind of take it all in. Jeez. So it's uh, my second time there, hopefully not my last. You, Van Pelt, and Nance, who's the tallest? I think Van Pelt. <laughs> I think Van Pretty Pelt. Close. He, he certainly feels like it, uh, you know, and he's – I've got a little bit more hair than him for now, so uh, – right. I think uh, you know. I think SVP's got it, but when, those are we could make a heck of a uh, older when gentleman's you, basketball team. When you talk to Jim Nance, and I know you've talked to him many times, but do you ever become mesmerized, like when you shake his hand? Like, say you see him at the field house. He was here last year. It's a Friday, and I got here early from Buffalo Wild Wings before practice was over, and there he was, and he's walking up with that the big imposing presence. And how are you? Or yeah. how? Or hi, Gavin. Or like like how he does it initially with the with whatever the signature line is. I mean, that's just doesn't it move you when you hear that? Yeah, I was with a couple of uh, my closest friends, and uh, <laughs> he walked up and hit us with the hello, friends. Thank and, you. And that was about all she wrote. Mm -hmm. You know, Jim's Jim's fantastic. Anytime they come to town to do our games, I always try to spend a little extra time with them. Just you know, nobody. You know, there's very few people just as respectful. But just so smart, wealth of knowledge, been around so many great people, and you know, in professional sports. So huge Jim Nance fan. I am. Um, uh, I sadly missed the press conference yesterday here because we were doing nine to noon. It was uh, excellent timing by Eck. Uh, excuse me. It, it fell right around you know when nine to noon was on the radio. So uh, let me guess, you dropped names. Like you, you were given names yesterday at the press conference, right? Like rookie hey, names and stuff. And of course, I wasn't there, and I missed it. Names. I mean, we, no names? we gave it all up. No, we're we did not. You didn't <laughs> you miss it all at the podium. I'm sure Vikings fans would probably agree. Anybody who uh, you know checked in that uh, not much and that you know not much came out of that. But yeah, that great. tends to be uh, you know it was the start of the off season. Uh, press conference. I, I, mm -hmm. I we I think uh, I made note of that in my mm -hmm. opening statement, and we didn't speak about it again. Yeah, uh, we spend most of our time talking about this funny little thing called the draft. Right, and and off that, um, it, it it can get here any time now, right? I mean, you've been through <laughs> enough of them, but you got two first round picks, and and you know it's it, it's the draft coming up uh, a week from Thursday with certain elements where it's strong or where it's not strong. Just doing your job. But it's different this year, your third year, and it could just go ahead and get here any time now, right? It absolutely can, but the good thing is our players are back. I always enjoy that week before the draft because I at least know, um, you know, I can take some peace in knowing our players will be back in the building and getting around those guys always energizes you, gets you ready to roll. You really feel like it's, you know, turning the page mm -hmm. to 2024 and starting to build our team, and, and the draft's going to be – uh, an exciting time for Vikings fans. It certainly will be for, you know, for our aspect of building what we hope to be this year and beyond. And uh, looking forward to it. It's been a great process. You know, Quasey and his staff, our coaching staff, um, you know, kind of putting it all together, working side by side. 
uh, it's been really good. Now we just, you know, unfortunately the draft is a, a scenario-based uh, kind of stretch of three days right. where you've got to be ready for uh, a lot of other teams, you know, making some similar decisions on how they're going to build their teams as well. And that's why we go through the process the way we do, and we have to have a plan of attack regardless of how it shapes up starting the night on Thursday. Kevin, I would imagine having the players back for the off-season workouts, whether you know you can be in the building, you have to use a Belichick uh, Hubble telescope to watch it from 10 miles away or, or, what, what, or just staying away is helping you sleep because you have other things to think about. I mean, <laughs> do you like run first-round scenarios through your mind or draft scenarios all the time? You do, especially, you know, considering you, you do that anyway when you have one first-round pick. Mind you, you've got two, yeah. you know, separated by 12 picks, and, and there's a lot of players in this draft. I think this is a very, very strong draft uh, at particular positions, but also just throughout. Uh, you know, you go back and you really talk to these guys and you find – a lot of these guys were in college a year longer than maybe they would have been had COVID not happened and they could take recruiting trips. A lot of these guys were guys that went to schools without ever stepping foot on campus because of the world and what it was like at that point. Then they transfer, uh, transfer rules, NIL, all that kicks in. So now you've got players that, that quite honestly have developed and maybe turned into better versions of themselves than would have been the case uh, had had all those circumstances not existed. So you're really evaluating a deep class. Uh, the age, I mean, I've talked to players that turned 21 a month or two ago. I've talked to guys that could be 26 by the middle of their rookie year. So mm. you're, you're talking about such a range of guys, where they are in their football journeys and trying to figure out not only what that looks like now, but what it will ultimately be, you know, when they become what we hope they do as Minnesota Vikings. Maybe, um, you know, maybe the maybe the the ultimate wild card is thrown into the first round of the draft, and all of a sudden you end up with Brock Bowers, and it's like just mash on teams with tight ends. First down, left to Bowers. First down, right to Hawkinson. Touchdown over the top to Johnny Munt, and that becomes <laughs> the, the identity of the Minnesota Vikings. And uh, Brock Bowers is the bomb, by the way, but. I don't know. I think that would throw the proverbial monkey wrench in a lot of the conversations a lot of people have been having in and or outside the building. Uh, how how does the football the football methodology part of uh, the equation help you? Oh, and you want to talk about Brock Bowers? I didn't think you did. Yeah, I was. Uh, he's a he's a heck of a player. There's no doubt. No but, doubt. Uh, I think just overall, um, you know, it all starts around your football philosophy, how you want your team to play, mm -hmm. and that's an evolving thing because. I think back on, you know, our first year into our second year here and, you, you know, I truly believe in many, many cases that, uh, you know, with NFL players, you got the right kind of guys, you're going to get what you emphasize. And so I put a lot of time and energy and thought into building uh, parameters from a standpoint of understanding how important our culture is in this building. But then you get to play style. You guys are going to hear me talk about the word play style, the words play style, I should say, a lot this year, because I think. I truly think year three now, we've got systems in, pl in place. Brian Flores, uh, you know, doing what he did last year, coming in here and really transforming the mentality of our defense. We want to continue to build upon that offensively. We really feel like at this point we can build an offensive system uh, based upon uh, some of the additions we've made. A guy like Aaron Jones adding to your team, getting back healthy again with Jets and, and Jordan and TJ's working through his process right now, and then just continuing to solidify, uh, you know, our identities as a football team, and then play style of understanding how important ball security is, and we learned that the very, very hard way, and uh, it's something we do emphasize. But you know, clearly, a part of being a coach that is still growing and developing and trying to be the best version of myself is I've got to continue to find ways to reach this team and emphasize the things that are important. Mm, soft and warm, the quiet storm. I kind of like that right there. Fire it up. It's gone now. <laughs> that's there must is there a press conference or something? But that's generally the music that's played before press conferences. But took me uh, back I thought to. It was, I thought it was like an award ceremony where that answer went a little long and you were trying to wrap me no. up right there. Well, why would you say your answers go long? They tend to do that. Well, I mean, no, are that. you kidding me? It's the best. <laughs> Don't change and don't let anybody ever tell you it's the best or the worst. Even though I just said it's the best. Um, but uh, nah, just that that music, that's a little smooth jazz instrumental. 
piece there uh, triggered me to be like, it's soft and warm. The Quiet Storm, K-F-A-N. It's Kevin O'Connell, coach of the Minnesota Vikings with yours truly, Paul Allen. And um, off the um, football methodology piece, you you have what what are known as simulations. Okay, yep. Quasi Adolfo Mensa talked about it last week. And, and in, in the in, in, outside of the building, we call them mock drafts. Um, and, you know, but they're obviously fans or people aren't running through 8,000 scenarios up to the draft. But is it fun? I mean, it, so- it sounds fun. It sounds like the kids, the, the, the kids game portion or the fan game portion of high end business. Yeah, it is, because you think about a lot of scenarios, right? And, and how do we come about that information? We have guys. Uh, in this building in our analytics department that can formulate things that, you know, we can click a button and have simulations run based upon all of those oh. of that information that's out there mm. that's giving you, you know, percentages on things likely to happen. And we can play out the likely scenarios and then mm. we can play out, uh, you know, teams moving up, moving down, whatever it may be. And, and we understand based upon studies of what other teams needs are because you got to in a lot of ways, you got to know your opponents, mm. even during draft season, because you have to know where people are likely to go with their selections when you're projecting mm-hmm. what, what kind of players could be available at 11 or 23 or any, anywhere else we could end up picking. And a lot goes into it. And then that's where you get the great dialogue, the discussion, player fit, how we see this guy maybe being a better version of himself as a Minnesota Viking then maybe going to another team. Mm. Maybe it's scheme based. Maybe it's where they're at. Yeah. Uh, you know, in their football development, and then ultimately uh, how they're going to fit in with some of the other critical pieces that we feel very strongly about within our locker room already. When that uh, when that music popped in there for yeah. a second, did you hear how quickly it was eliminated? I mean, how about the quick twitch of the it's producer Nordo? He, I, I mean, mean, you're in the quick twitch business. You look for it. You pay for it. You draft it. How about that quick twitch? No, it was no different than, a, you know, <laughs> resetting to a backside in cut, you know, finding <laughs> finding a way to move the chains yeah. on a third and eight. Uh, you uh-huh. know, uh, overcoming coaching in a lot of ways is is a, <laughs> a, is a very important, ta- you know, a very important talent in this building. That was beautiful. Um, it, it, with, with the simulations or, or the, as the fans would say, the mocks and you know, button push and it all happens, not moving cards or anything. Um, do, do you, you or anybody ever like wake up, not in cold sweat, like fashion, but like, we haven't talked about this team moving up enough and nobody's talking about it. And we all claim we don't read here, or watch anything, but we all read here and watch everything. Um, and, and we don't talk about this enough. And this player at this spot is not very good. So let's think that even though he makes a lot, they might, you know what I'm saying? Like, does that ever happen? I think the biggest thing is, you know, I, there's, I've been a part of some drafts where, some very, very strong uh, takes and narratives really drive uh, through the whole uh, draft process. And, mm. and you're just watching the tape. You're doing your evaluations. You're meeting these players. And you don't see it the same way. Mm. And ultimately, in the end, a lot of times, uh, you know, the 32 teams tend to see it a little bit closer mm-hmm. uh, to each other than maybe some of the things that are out there. And yeah. I know <laughs> I know a lot of these mock drafts and things are coming from, you know, little whispers here and there and, yeah. and inside information. Uh, but in the end, we nobody knows what's really going to happen. There may be some uh, pretty, you know, pretty strong things, yeah. feelings about, uh, you know, the first pick in the draft or, uh, you know, what type of position there might be runs on early yeah. in the draft. But in the end, mm-hmm. uh, the draft's going to start. There's going to be some things that we didn't expect to happen, uh, how we handle that and, and how we ultimately come out with the, the best possible selections comes back to the process at which took place over really long before uh, these last two, three months. That's when the, us as coaches really get involved throughout yeah. this offseason. But Quasi and his staff have been building up to this really since the day last year's draft ended and, and you know, in some cases even before that. In in our world, whether here at Twin Cities Orthopedics Performance Center, I'm talking about the radio show or just football fans, is we talk about so much so frequently and sometimes it will hone into an A topic, at least what we perceive to be an A topic. But through the conversation, you know, there, there are things that just don't get mentioned that I think should not be swept under the table. And, and this one about your team is, is no, no matter how you analyze the defense, the Brian Flores defense from A through the end. So if it's like, all right, there goes, there goes Mike Evans, and, and now we got this in Philly, and then we got Keenan Allen, whoo, and then it tightened. You know, so from the outside, I'd be like, all right, it went quick twitch for all of them. But, hey, it takes a little bit. Uh, that, that's my opinion. Then at the end of the season – 
you know, it, you got players playing more than they've ever played in their lives. Yeah. So if legs got tired a little bit, that's understandable too. But in between, there was a lot of good, so much good in my estimation that like Harrison Phillips, Jordan Hicks, Cam Bynum, Josh Metellus, let's go on, Jonathan Bullard, let's go on and on. They, they, they had the best seasons of their careers yep. <laughs> at, at, for long patches. So now the next year with this tricky thing and with that leader, I'm not going to be like Evans and Blackman. I'm not going to put names on it. That's going to happen because I don't think a lot of people saw me in, in the building. You probably did. But a lot of people on the outside didn't see a lot of that coming. But it was fact. It's going to happen again. You know, with with those who have been in this system for the second year yep. and whatever players you draft, depending on how quickly they can get it, because it is complicated, I would imagine. It is. And, and ultimately, what I was most proud of is just the way our defense and, and really Flo and his staff a year ago uh, kind of morphed and, and changed their style throughout the season, presenting different looks, different type of uh, mentality to how Flo called it and, and really trying to do whatever it took to try to give us a chance to win that particular game, mm -hmm. that particular Sunday. I think as we go into year two of Flo's defense, uh, the the hope is we continue to, you know, kind of really strengthen that identity of what we want to be as a Vikings defense, but also, uh, you know, get in a situation where we can truly, by adding a few more pieces here and there, some of the great pieces that I thought we added in free agency, we can continue to attempt to dictate through scheme and our players on the field of allowing them to play fast, yep. physical, going to come back to that that play style thing again um, and ultimately continue to grow from year one to year two. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, uh, to, two two quickies left. I got a game here for you. Hopefully you like it. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the NFC North, I mean, I'm not breaking news here. It, it's getting tougher by the second. It definitely is. I mean, it's like it's. I'm not going to go best division in football bit. The AFC North is pretty good. And, you know, you got the Chiefs over there and stuff in the AFC West. But, man, our division – our. <laughs> Our division's becoming quite the meat grinder, isn't it? It is, and you look at uh, you know some of the things people have been able to do, acquiring talent, and you know having uh, r some real draft capital over the years uh, in in one way or the other. Whether uh, you know the, what Detroit's done to build up their team and really build some a strong core of players along their fronts and adding skill players and doing the things that they've done, um, and then you look at obviously Chicago's in a in a prime position to continue to uh, make the most of you know, some pretty serious assets and the transition from Aaron Rodgers to, to Jordan Love up in Green Bay and what he was able to really turn that offense into, especially down the stretch and through the playoffs. It's going to be very competitive. Uh, ultimately, we have a lot of confidence that we can build a team to be competitive. And we know the games are going to be close. And when games are close, you yep. got to play good football. you got to play smart. you got to have that situational feel of how you're going to try to either close out a, victory or a lead you may have or chase it down in the end like we did in 2022. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to have to build a team that can play for four quarters, not do the things that lose games before we ever give ourselves a real shot to win them uh, is probably the most important thing. And we're going to be transitioning um, you know, with a, with a new quarterback. Uh, we're going to be transitioning with some new players on defense. So that's where I've really challenged our coaches to, from the first moment we get in front of these guys as of yesterday to be building you know, the mentality of this spring is about teaching, learning, the development of younger players, the growth and, and the addition that we've had with free agency in the draft. But ultimately, by the time we come to training camp, our guys need to be ready to compete. They need to be ready for a physical training camp and uh, build this football team to withstand not only our division, but once again, it just seems like it every year you got a heck of a schedule out in front of you when you finally get, get a look at that thing. Um, we got to be ready to go for 17 games and see where we fall. I pulled a uh, – to close, I pulled a um, – draft analysis piece yep. of a quarterback from a draft yep. from NFL.com. Okay. okay. So I didn't go any out, you know, outside wild ones or I went to NFL.com and this quarterback is not you. Okay. okay? So I'm going to give you some hints, some clues, and let's see if you can figure out who this is. Okay. You in? Yep. Number one, uh, the report loves his size, arm strength, accuracy, pocket mobility, poise, at poise and field reading capability. Is it in which draft is this? Are we going back for? I said a quarterback in a draft. So we're we're not going back to Sammy Baugh. <laughs> I'm slinging Sammy Baugh is not the answer. Number two says his windup is an eyesore, but has velocity to mitigate additional release time. Makes it sound like he needs to start working out of the stretch. 
I didn't get a chance to answer number one first. No, no, these are all just clues. Okay. It's an answer to one person. Oh my goodness! Okay, I'm mm -hmm. ready. I'm ready for uh, number three. I think I think I know where we're going with this. Clue number three: completion percentage unaffected by blitzes, and it might be one of the ones this year. I mean, it could be the 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 four everybody in the universe talks about, or the next two. Or the next one, or the guy who throws the ball 80 yards and played at Tennessee. Can I uh, can I make a guess? You want to make a guess right now? You're sure. Okay. Well, clue number four is grandfather is named Dick Hammer. That's his name. Sam Darnold. Uh, come on, man! How'd you figure that out? Yeah, yeah we do. We do a little bit. But of But why didn't you go like here. Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, Caleb Williams, Spencer Rattler? Um, um, uh, the the uh, Ch Alex Smith, you know, it was uh, I would have guessed Sam really? after the did the third... Dick Hammer give it away? <laughs> well, <laughs> after, no, that no, after that's the third clue. After two, I was thinking Josh Allen. Yeah, but then... well, that that's his grandfather's real name, by the way. This is not from some weird web. This is NFL.com. Yep, his grandfather was a USC basketball player, unbelievable athlete. Yep, you knew that? I did. Oh, this sucks. Olympic volleyball star and one one of the original Marlboro man. Yep. Well, of course you knew that. Yep. Jeez, yep. holy cow. And then I didn't think you would get it. And then I was going to say he's currently on your team and he's in the building right now. That was clue number five. <laughs> okay, well, just just off this, this wind-up thing. I mean, they're making they're making him sound like a former Cy Young Award winner. What uh, like what's the wind up? I mean, yeah. Come, so coming is that out a of thing? coming out of USC, there you know there was uh, you know depending on on how you viewed certain throws that Sam would make, there were some times where that uh, you know that release and, and that motion was maybe a little bit longer. But like with a lot of you know guys in this league, the game speeds up. You start to play mm -hmm. uh, hopefully in a rhythm based offense where you can tie your feet and eyes together and yeah. anticipate throws and do some things where you're playing on your time clock and not the defenses. Uh, Sam's had the ability to really. I think that's one of the things I that jumped out to me. It was limited tape, no no doubt, from his year in San Francisco. But I thought he really got efficient with his lower half. He really got really? Uh, in a place where he could uh, – he looked to me like he was in a uh, a true growth stage, even at this point in his career. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I saw a lot of good things that I cannot wait when we are allowed, PA, yeah. to get out on the grass and start coaching these guys. Uh, Sam's going to be somebody uh, that I'm, I'm just excited to work with. And I've always been a fan. Um, and I think uh, the quarterback environment is a huge thing for all of us that have ever attempted to play the game. And Big time. I get to be in a role where I get to try to help that for all the guys that play quarterback for us. Completion percentage unaffected by blitzes. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. I appreciate you all the time. Yeah, I go back to Thank he you. played against uh, Ohio State, uh, I believe, in the Cotton Darnold? Bowl. Darnold? Yeah. And, and you were Washington quarterbacks coach, passing game coordinator. And, so uh, you're looking hard at him, right? And whether it was, uh, you know, it was the full gamut of that Ohio State defense. And mm -hmm. not a lot of them were blocked that night. And he mm -hmm. stood in there and uh, stared down the barrel making throws. <laughs> and I just remember that's that's always been something I remember about it. Because you can learn a lot about guys when circumstances yeah. are not, uh, let's just call them less than ideal. Right. Uh, Mr. Ekstrom, let the record show the final two minutes of this interview were all courtesy of Kevin O'Connell. So I hit my... <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you, ma'am.